Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to Taste and See on SSC Live TV. My name is Ken Jobst, and I'm here to accompany you on this journey at the intersection of faith and food. Today, we're going to be asking a big question. And that big question is, how does it get to the menu? How is it that certain things make it to the menu, certain foods, and certain foods we, we never get around to putting on the menu? It's a moderate question for us, but it was a big question in the time of Jesus. And it was a big question for Peter the disciple. Let's take a look. In the biblical book of Acts, chapter 10, we're going to take a look at verses 9 through 16. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Follow along with me. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on a housetop to pray. About the sixth hour. By the way, that's about 12 noon, the way you and I keep time. Verse 10. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him. Rise, Peter. Kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call unclean. This was done three times. And the object was taken up to heaven again. Now that's the word of the Lord from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. Peter has this vision. And it's a vision. He's so hungry. They've been traveling. It's 12 noon. It's the hottest part of the day. It's lunchtime. And as he's hungry and tired from being on the road, he wants to eat. And as his, his buddies are fixing the lunch, he falls into a trance. And this great sheet, it had to be, you know, we're, we're talking about bigger than a bed sheet. We're, we're talking about something huge because it's able to contain four-footed animals of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and birds of the air are all in this huge thing like a sheet that, watch this, it's coming down out of heaven. Its source is heaven. All of these animals come down and the voice speaks to Peter. I love this part. Wait, you go ahead and look in the New Testament and see how many times a voice from heaven speaks to one of the apostles. It, I mean, speaks to one of the apostles. Sure, the, you know, the, the, the voice speaks to, to, to Jesus, but take a look at how many people in the New Testament have a voice from heaven addressed to them. Peter is one of those people. The voice says, specifically, rise, Peter, kill and eat. He's hungry. He's ready to eat. But inside this big sheet, all it is appears to be unclean animals. And so Peter says, no, Lord. <laughs> By the way, according to C.S. Lewis, you know, you can say one of those words or the other. You can't say, no, Lord. You can say, Lord. You can say, no. But to say no Lord is a contradiction in terms because if you're saying no, then you're not serving the Lord. And if you're serving the Lord, you don't say no to the Lord. But Peter said, 
No, Lord, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Now, this all goes through the second time. Then it happens again. And, and the voice says, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And, uh, of course, <laughs> to get it through Peter's head or to get it through my head, it, it comes down three times and repeats for emphasis. Now, watch this. You've got to understand that the ability to distinguish between the clean and the unclean was a central focus of the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament book of Leviticus, we get the, the, the Hebraic food laws, the dietary laws. And the dietary laws are, are placed in Leviticus chapter 11 for us to consider. Now, this all has to do with what's clean and what's unclean, what's acceptable for food and what's not acceptable for food. And it impresses upon the hearts of the faithful that there are certain things pleasing to God, there are certain things that are not pleasing to God. And so God's people were to not defile themselves with common or unclean food. They were to strive and to maintain a what we would call a kosher diet, a diet that was comprised of allowed food. Now, let's look. Leviticus chapter 11. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Say to the Israelites, Of all the animals that live on the land, these are the ones that you may eat. You may eat any animal that has a divided hoof and that chews the cud. There are some that only chew the cud or only have a divided hoof, but you must not eat them. The camel, though it chews the cud, doesn't have a divided foot. It is ceremonially unclean for you. The, the hydrax, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided foot. It is unclean for you. The rabbit, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It's unclean for you. The pig, although it has a divided hoof, it does not chew the cud, so it's unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses because they are unclean for you. Verse 9 says, Of all the creatures living in the water of the seas and the streams, you may eat any that have fins and scales, but the creatures in the seas or streams that do not have fins or scales, whether among all the swarming things or among all the other living creatures in the water, you are to regard as unclean. And since you are to regard them as unclean, you may not eat their meat. You must regard their carcasses as unclean. Anything living in the water that does not have fins and scales is regarded to be unclean by you. Now, I'm going to skip ahead a few verses to verse 41. Watch this. It turns interesting really quickly. Every creature that moves along the ground is to be regarded as unclean. It's not to be eaten. You're not to eat any creature that moves along the ground, whether it moves on its belly or walks on all fours or on many feet. It is unclean. Do not defile yourselves by any of these creatures. Do not make yourselves unclean by means of them, or be made unclean by them. Verse 44, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy, because I am holy. Now that's Leviticus chapter 11. And if you take a look at the, the, the whole of the law, the, the Torah of God, take a look at these first five books of Moses. They go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Right in the middle of the middle book of the Bible, it says, excuse me, right in the middle of the middle book of the Torah, 
in the middle of Leviticus at the end of chapter 11. It says, be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And that statement, which is key to the entirety of the Bible, is found in the context of God teaching Israel about what's clean to eat and what's not clean to eat. Now, how does this apply to the book of Acts, and then how does the book of Acts apply to us today? Glad you asked. Watch this. There were three major distinguishing characteristics about the Jewish nation, about the people of the Jewish nation. The first distinguishing characteristic was that they were children of the covenant. And so every, every one of the, the boys was circumcised on the eighth day. So circumcision was a sign of the covenant. Also, temple observances, sacrifices, were characteristic of the Jewish people, right? They, they went to the temple in Jerusalem three times a year, and they offered the sacrifices. The third thing, circumcision, temple ordinances, then the third thing that set the Jewish people apart was their dietary code. The dietary ordinances set the Jews apart from every other nation around them. Now, understand this. The most obvious of these distinguishing characteristics for anybody that's just walking around, right? The most obvious of these distinguishing characteristics was the dietary restrictions that were placed on the people of God. If you went out in the neighborhood, you know, if, if you traveled, if you went beyond Israel and you maintained a kosher diet, right? Then other people would look at you and say, well, why aren't you eating that cheeseburger? And, and then you'd have to say, well, God doesn't allow us to mix milk and meat in the same meal. Oh, really? Why, why is that? Well, okay. But the whole idea was that it was the diet, what's acceptable to be on the menu, that set apart most obviously God's people from the other people around them. Now, as it turns out, in Acts chapter 10, we've got this episode where where God is lowering this big sheet with all these different kinds of animals in it, tells Peter, arise, Peter, kill and eat. You're hungry, it's lunchtime, go ahead and kill any of these animals. Peter says, no, Lord, because I've never, ever eaten anything common or unclean. Now, now, listen to that. To say, I've never, ever done something, what's, where's the focus? In, in Peter's protest. The focus is on Peter. It's all about him. I've never done that. Oh, I would never eat anything unclean. So the focus is on him, but watch. Peter goes on, and you know he's, he's pulled in different ways about this, because in, in verse 28 of Acts chapter 10, Peter says, look, we're not supposed to associate, we're not supposed to visit Gentiles. We're not supposed to come under their roof. We're not supposed to, you know, uh, converse with them. Now, now watch this. Nowhere in the Torah did it say that Jews were not to have interaction with Gentiles. Nowhere does it say that they're prohibited from having interaction with Gentiles. It says you need to abide by this particular type of diet. Now, let's ask the question, because it's an important question, and it's one that, that always comes up. Here's the question. Why did God choose these particular dietary restrictions for his people? Why did he choose you can only eat that which chews the cud and has a divided hoof? Why did he say the only things that you can eat out of the water are the things with fins and scales? Watch. As it turns out, for years and years and years, I've heard the explanation that, well, this is all about hygiene. That, of course, you wouldn't want to uh, have shellfish in the desert. You wouldn't want to have, uh, you, you wouldn't want to be eating pork if it's going to expose you to trichinosis. So, you, you know what? I accepted that for years and years and years and thought, well, okay, maybe that's the whole explanation. Now I don't think that's the case. Because why didn't God just say, you can eat pork, you just have to cook it thoroughly? 
right? They're cooking food anyway. What, what if God just said, no rare pork? Wouldn't that have taken care of the hygiene issue? And you know what? There's plenty of other people out there who understood you don't take lobster, uh, you know, out into the desert, four days into the desert, and expect it not to have spoiled. Like, other cultures picked up on that idea pretty quickly. So, so I'm really not buying the hygiene argument so much as I once did with respect to why God prohibited some foods and allowed others. There's another idea. The other idea is that, well, these other animals were used in pagan ritual. And as a matter of fact, there's cases, remember that in the Bible, the only acceptable sacrifices were listed. And the acceptable sacrifices were lambs, doves, you know, a, a, a bull, if it was a, a big, big sacrifice. So the use of the animal in the pagan ritual, I think that might shed a little bit more light and it kind of puts us in the right direction. But you know what? Uh, bulls were used in pagan ritual and they're also used in the temple ritual. They were also a part of that, uh, the, the, you know, the, the golden calf in Exodus chapter 32, where people got into quite a bit of trouble. So maybe it's not all about hygiene. Maybe it's not all about the pagan ritual. Maybe, and, and here's where I'm finding more evidence. Maybe it's that these are the animals that are closest to the ideal type of that subset. Now, what do I mean by that? Remember that to serve in the temple, that if you were going to be part of the Aaronic priesthood, you had to be without blemish. You had to be you know, pretty well perfect. As they say, you had to be complete, had to be whole. Then you could serve at the temple. Now, with these, these domains, the domain of the air, the domain of the water, the domain of the land, the animals that were considered clean then formed the ideal of those particular animals. So in a herding type world, right, the, the sheep, the goats, the cattle were the acceptable animals. The acceptable things from the sea had fins and scales. The acceptable birds were birds that were not predators, and there were birds that were not carnivores. Now, watch this. All of this discussion about diet gets coalesced into a very, very pointed discussion about not the menu itself, but a question of who is allowed to eat with the menu. You know, who am I allowed to eat with? And so the question is not about food, the question is about people. The question is about with whom can I share fellowship? With whom can I share a meal? Because the most regular fellowship activity that we engage in over time is the fellowship activity of sharing a meal with people. So in this situation, we find Peter, and Peter has now been alerted that we're not to call common what God has cleansed. And what applies for food now is going to apply to the nations. Once again, as I said, the Jews were never prohibited in the Torah from reaching out to have fellowship with the other nations. No, they couldn't worship in their temple. No, they couldn't you know, intermarry at the level of king. But there was nothing that said, don't go out and you know, buy an orange from somebody that's from another na nation, that sort of thing. Now, this brings us now to our, uh, oh my goodness, look at this, our dish for the day. And our dish for the day is in celebration of Acts chapter 10. Because in Acts chapter 10, God says, don't call common what God calls clean. Now, we have today, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to say, look at this right here. We've got a little shrimp cocktail that has come to us, uh, cur courtesy of Taste and See. And remember, 
Shrimp would have fallen on the side of the unclean items that come from the sea because shrimp have no fins or scales. Ah, you, you know what else? This is very interesting to me. So much seafood does not have fins or scales. We can take a look at, okay, one of my favorites, lobster. Lobster, once again, it's a shellfish. It has no fins, has no scales. What about oysters? Nope, oysters would have been off the menu because, once again, they don't have fins, they don't have scales. Ooh, wait a minute. Now, it's not only things from the ocean, it's things from the other waters as well, from lakes and streams. Watch this. What about catfish? I love catfish. I love lightly breaded, fried catfish. That's at the top of my list wherever I go, right? Wonderful, wonderful. Just absolutely delectable. But however, that's on the list of unclean foods in the Old Testament. Because why? Because catfish doesn't, oh, it's got fins, but it doesn't have scales. And so therefore, it would be off the list. Well, today we've got shrimp. And the, the thing that, uh, mercy, the thing that just delights me about shrimp is this. They come in so many different varieties. They come in whatever size you can imagine. They come reasonably plentifully. Like you can go to just about any, gro any grocery store and find shrimp. And at the risk of sounding like Bubba Gump, right, you, you, you can have shrimp etouffee, you can have boiled shrimp, shrimp on the grill, fried shrimp, breaded shrimp. They're, they're so incredibly versatile. But today, today we have a very simple, straightforward shrimp cocktail. And all it is is this. We've, we've got the shrimp. These, by the way, are wild-caught shrimp. I'll, I'll get to the difference in just a moment. But wild-caught shrimp, I believe they're imported. They're from somewhere in Southeast Asia, just to tell you the truth. I think these were imported from Thailand. And these shrimp have been boiled, so they've already been cooked. They've been deveined, so the sand vein has been taken out from them. And they have been partially shelled. So in the partial shelling, you'll find that they have conveniently left the, uh, the, the tails. Now, <laughs> when I was a kid, not knowing any better, right, uh, I had a tendency just to eat the whole thing. And when I would eat the whole thing, it was like, yeah, this, this, this bite's pretty good. This bite's pretty good. But man, that last bite was always the crunchiest, but it was the one that I had the most trouble with. So... I'm so delighted to learn now, now that it's a little, you know, past, <laughs> past when I should have learned these things. Oh, I, yeah, take off the tail and set it aside. Now, what we have with this shrimp is it's shrimp cocktail accompaniment. And, and watch, I tried in vain to determine where the classic shrimp cocktail was first served. I had been told that the shrimp cocktail as we see it today, that with, you know, basically with chilled shrimp, with a cocktail sauce that is, watch this, it's good old American ketchup and horseradish, right? So who first served the very first chilled shrimp cocktail? I've got one source that's telling me it actually began in Manhattan, in New York City, in the 1950s. But somehow or another, that seems very, very late to me. Shrimp have been harvested for about, yike. In America, shrimp have been harvested since the 1790s. But around the world, certainly shrimp have been harvested at least in the last, certainly, thousand years. And the, uh, the nets that are used in shrimping it's all very fascinating stuff. However, let's take a look at the sauce. Once again, the sauce is <laughs> quintessentially American, right? What could be more American than ketchup? And as a matter of fact, some of my culinary friends who have gone to culinary school and, and are, you know, ha have been 
employed by Michelin star restaurants refer to ketchup as the American sauce, right? All it is is, uh, you know, it, it certainly cooked down and reduced sweetened tomato sauce. So this ketchup along with a measure of horseradish. So the shrimp is begging for some sort of acidic flavor, right? It, it needs the acidic jolt to light the fuse on the flavor that's in the shrimp. So we come at it two different ways. We come at it with the ketchup, which is going to be part of the regular sauce. So the ketchup is basically acidic, but we also approach it with the ever popular lemon wedge. So with a, a, a lemon wedge, we can begin that little transformation. Um, there we go. Now we, we've got a little bit of the acid that is beginning to work there. And it's, it's, this is not like soaking them in lemon juice. It's not a sebaceous kind of thing. We're, we're not cooking them in citric acid. No, we're, we're, just, we're just enlightening the flavor, right? In addition to the ketchup, as I've said, we've got this other dimension. And the other dimension is horseradish. Now, horseradish is, is certainly going to light you right up. So, uh, horseradish is, is a spice that is going to let you know that it's there. And frankly, I love it. Uh, I, I could, I would be happy with a um, a cocktail sauce that was three parts ketchup and one part horseradish, and I know that's ridiculous. It should be like three parts, or, or let, let's call it eight parts ketchup and maybe one part horseradish. But it it brings out the flavor. Now, now watch because something amazingly radically different happens if we take a different spice agent alongside the shrimp. So let's say we're not going to use the horseradish. If we take the horseradish out and instead we substitute something like a cayenne pepper or a, uh, a sriracha, something along that line, it completely changes the entire experience of the dish. Now, once again, I've chosen just a straight ahead shrimp cocktail because of its simplicity and the ability to simply convey the flavor. Now, but once, once again, one other thing I want to mention about shrimp and your diet. It goes like this. Shrimp are a wonderful source of protein. It, it, as a matter of fact, this little shrimp, this little guy right here, packed with protein. That's the upside. But by the way, this little shrimp friend of mine, practically no carbs in this shrimp at all. No, no, no carbs, right? However, these little guys are just packed with cholesterol. And I know that sometimes cholesterol goes in favor, it comes out of favor, what, whatever, whatnot. But if, you're, if you have been instructed by your doctor to pay attention to cholesterol in your diet, you might want to steer clear of shrimp because on the cholesterol scale for a serving of any given food, most list shrimp as the highest level of cholesterol in any commonly consumed food. So just take that under advisement. Be aware that that's, that's part of it. However, on the other hand, I'm so glad there's another hand. On the other hand, in moderation, and you know, if you can, uh, if you can do the uh, Lay's potato chip, veg candy, just one approach to shrimp, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and dip this one in. And, and I, I do a pretty aggressive dip, as you can see right here. Oh, yeah. Even with that. Oh, that's just the perfect, that's the perfect ratio of horseradish and ketchup with a squirt of lemon. Because the first thing I taste is the lemon, but the lemon moves aside. And the lemon moves aside so I can taste the tomato. The tomato moves aside so I can taste the horseradish. The horseradish tastes, the horseradish moves aside so I can taste the shrimp. 
So it's a four layer taste all in one bite. So I strongly, strongly recommend. Now, I mentioned these guys, these, these little shrimp came to us from far away Thailand. And of course, they they were wild caught in Thailand. As a matter of fact, I would like to say just one word before we get out of here about the difference between shrimp and prawns. You may have heard prawns on the grill versus shrimp on the grill. Typically, now, now this is not a hard and fast rule, but typically, shrimp come from salt water. Prawns typically come from fresh water. And a good friend of mine invited me over to a feast one time of prawns that were from the uh, Kentucky State Aquaculture Program. Matter of fact, they were taken out of a pond that Kentucky State had, had stocked with the little baby prawns. They grew all summer, and it was about the autumn of the year, right about in October, when they were harvested. And I was able to, to buy a couple pounds of them, boil them up. They were delicious. So if you ever get a chance to uh, connect with Kentucky State University and their aquaculture program, look into it about prawns. And by the way, the, the shrimp that we have here today are magic shrimp. They're not, they're, 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 they have the ability to disappear. And so you may be among the last of the folk that see these shrimp because very soon, very quickly, they're going to disappear from sight. And I, I think we're all going to have something to do with that. All right? Anyway, so back to our scripture lesson. Just remember, the apostle Peter, as he was on his way, encountered God, God said, look, lowering this sheet, don't call unclean that which I call clean, God says. And so it's all on the menu and everybody's invited around the table is what God is telling us in Acts chapter 10. I hope to see you around the table. Thank you so much for making time this week for this installment of Taste and See on SSC Live TV. Be an inviter. Let somebody else know that we meet here every week at the intersection of food and faith. Until next time, this is Ken Jobst for SSC Live TV. God bless and take care. Bye-bye.